Hey there, we'll be back with a new episode for you next week. In the meantime, we're sharing one of our favorites from the archive in case you missed it the first time around. Enjoy. I've spent my career going back to that thesis and answering you know, some of those questions. You know, how can you analyze music mathematically? How can you visualize music? How can you touch and feel music? So these were things I was exploring and looking at different mediums to create that tactile experience. Hi, everyone. I'm Amy Devers, and this is Clever. Today, I'm talking to Michael Ford. Michael Ford is a designer, activist, and better known as the hip-hop architect, as he explores architecture and design through the lens of hip-hop culture. He's the founder of the Hip Hop Architecture Camp, an international award-winning youth camp which positions hip hop culture as a catalyst to help underrepresented youth understand, critique, and generate architecture. Also, currently, he's working with some of hip hop's greatest names as he leads the design of the Universal Hip Hop Museum in the Bronx. He's been featured in Rolling Stone Magazine, on the Oprah Winfrey Network, The Today Show, and Architect Magazine. And as a speaker, he's done keynotes with the South by Southwest, American Institute of Architects, and a TEDx talk titled Hip Hop Architecture as Modernism's Post-Occupancy Evaluation. He's fresh off a collaboration with Herman Miller called Conversations for Change, in which he remixed an iconic Eames lounge chair and hosted conversations on Instagram Live about racial injustice to raise awareness for the greater movement and funds for youth who've been affected by police brutality. You can see the chair and hear the talks on the Herman Miller IGTV channel. Here's Michael Ford. My name is Michael Ford. I am based in Madison, Wisconsin, and I'm known as the hip hop architect. I'm a designer. I'm an educator. My goal is to make cities better for the people who live in them, but also provide the people who live in them an opportunity to envision uh, what it is that they want uh, in their cities. I love that. In order to trace the the steps to where you got to now, I always like to go all the way back to the beginning. And I read that you were born and raised in Detroit. Is that true? Yeah. Well, to be more specific, in a city called Highland Park, uh, which is in the center of the city of Detroit, so bound on all sides by Detroit. Uh, Detroit steals our thunder because it's the actual place where uh, Henry Ford started the assembly line. It's in Highland Park, not Detroit. But yeah, born and raised in Highland Park, you know, also, you you know, raised in the city of Detroit as well. I feel some kinship. I was born and raised in Ypsilanti, which is only about a half an hour away and sometimes gets the nickname Little D. So, you know, Detroit is uh, looms large in Michigan and permeates the culture there. But can you talk to me about your childhood and maybe your family dynamic and what kind of kid you were? How did your creativity and curiosity and intellect start to express itself? I grew up uh, both parents at home. My dad is a, a minister and, and a roofer, and my mother you know, works in healthcare. I, I would think that I was an inquisitive kid. I grew up being told to question everything, partly because of my church life. Uh, Grew up in a home where you were at church multiple days a week. Uh, It was Wednesday, it was Saturday, it was Sunday, Friday nights. But, you know, we were a non-denomination church, so we were not Christians. But we, you know, read the Bible uh, and was told to, you know, question and find deeper truths within everything that we, um, that we read, not only in the Bible, but that was also, uh, talked about with our, our lives as well and, and things around us. And that's how I grew up. If you're told something, uh, you know, go back, research it until you can uh, agree with it or, or answer every question you might have about it. An interesting thing about my church, we owned a lot of property throughout the city of Detroit and uh, Highland Park. You know, I grew up above one of our community centers. So it's a mixed-use building, 
So the ground floor was uh, our restaurant and our community center. And at top was you know, a few apartments. And that's the place I was born and, and raised until first grade or something. But I have some vivid memories of that apartment because every Friday night, I, we had a kitty disco at our church community center. That's awesome. But also on Saturdays, the adults had their own parties and events. But there was this back stairwell from our apartment where you could sit right next to the DJ booth and see the dance floor. And it was a dark stairwell. If you looked at the stairwell, you couldn't see anything back there. But, you know, me, my sisters, if I had a cousin or a friend who spent the night, that was where we spent our Friday nights and Saturday nights, like looking at the dance floor, listening to the music, peeking into the DJ booth. Uh, That was our, our secret spot. And, you know, that's where my love of music started. During those events, you would hear everything from gospel to, to jazz, heard blues, and you definitely heard hip hop. So this, for me, is the, the early 80s. You know, hip hop is, is really starting to you know, travel around the country and be played everywhere at that time. So that was my early years in life. And, you know, the way that I got introduced to architecture I went to a program at a school called the Center for Creative Studies. And this was in elementary school. But I went there because I wanted to design cars. I was a person who drew a lot. So I'm drawing comic book characters, cartoon characters for people in their folders at school. Mm -hmm. You paid a dollar to like, you know, hook up all their folders and notebooks. Or you would draw cars, you know, these futuristic cars. And my teacher told me, you should go to Center for Creative Studies and have a career in designing cars. And long story short, I went there and I found out that, you know, there's going to be a new car that comes out every year. The same person doesn't necessarily design that new car. And you don't necessarily design an entire car. Uh, You might design parts. And at that moment, I said, well, if I design a car this year, someone designs one next year, people might not ever drive my car. And that critical thinking is already in play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that was my thinking as a, a, a young kid in elementary school. And the teacher told me, well, you should think about architecture. You design a building, uh, that building might last longer than you. And people can always experience what's inside of that building. At that moment, you know, I made a switch and said, you know what? I think I'm going to study architecture. And this was from elementary school. I think this is so fascinating because you've already painted a really vivid picture of kind of huddling in this dark stairwell with your access point to the music that was happening on Friday and Saturday nights. And, you know, that's an architectural nook that is incubating, as, as you say, you know, architecture incubates culture. I mean, that happened for you at a, at a young age. I love that you figured out that automobile design wasn't necessarily going to have the longevity or legacy that you were looking for. So maybe architecture is more important. Yeah, it was um, a great suggestion. I, I wish I remembered this teacher's name. I always said I need to go back and find her. But yeah, it, it was a great suggestion. When I told my dad about you know, hey, I think I'm going to do architecture instead of automobile. Then he pulled out his portfolio because he went to school to become an interior designer. No way. Before having five of us, that was one of his dreams. You know, I'm in fourth or fifth grade at this point. I mean, I'm, I'm young. You know, he pulls out his portfolio and it's these large sketches of different spaces. It's like, yeah, well, this is what your dad wanted to become, you know, try to draw some of these pictures. And you know, that's when he uh, started telling me about drawing perspectives. We started drawing things around the house on a block. Um, and then even took me on uh, into his career later on of being a roofer and, you know, let me see drawings, you know, cities from, from up above. Wow. And did you have no idea that your dad had this interior design background? None whatsoever. This was in the basement. Um, <laughs> you know, went to school for interior design. We went to school to become an HVAC engineer. And eventually, with uh, a ton of mouths to feed and a, and a wife, you know, he went to, you know, became a commercial roofer. 
which is still a great career. But yeah, I didn't know about these uh, drawings that were tucked away in the basement. And I mean, they were incredible. Yeah, what a discovery. And what a bonding moment with your dad, it sounds like. And I'm, I'm guessing then you got no resistance to the idea of becoming an architect. You know, yeah. some, some parents are really concerned about pushing their child into a creative profession because they worry about economic viability. But it sounds like you had um, encouragement coming from a few different places. Yeah, most definitely. He was off board. He was excited, you know, as, as well as my family. And again, we spent most of our time at church. And as I mentioned before, you know, my church owns a significant amount of property uh, around the city of Detroit, you know, where members you know, live in houses that were owned by the church, at restaurants, activity centers, arcades, you know, places that, you know, my pastor, the membership said that these are going to be safe places for us to live out our youth, but then also the young adults who are there, you, know, you don't have to go out into uh, a nightclub or somewhere in the city. We can create our own safe space, our own type of music in a time where it definitely was some, some challenges around the city as far as safety. So you know, our church created its own safe haven, and a lot of people were you know, in the building trades and were renovating and literally like building the, the places and spaces that the church owned. So now with someone interested in architecture. So no resistance whatsoever. It's like, yes, come on. So did this passion continue into your teenage years? And are there any sort of formative experiences, triumphs or challenges that you look back on as milestones in your development? Yeah. So as a teenager, the high school I went to was extremely important, you know, helping me reach the next stage. I went to Cass Tech High School in Detroit. So shout out Cass Tech. <laughs> uh, it's a, a high school with a storied history in the city. So a number of entertainers and, and change makers from the city graduated from the school. So people like uh, Diana Ross, you know, rapper Big Sean, a lot of people in between those two. The, the first Black Miss America, the list goes on. But one of the things that was special about Cash Tech is you had an opportunity to pick a major uh, when you went to the high school. Hmm. So public school, uh, you had to take a test to get in. Uh, the school is in downtown Detroit, so it wasn't a neighborhood high school. So they had a little bit more flexibility. My major was architecture. While there, you know, I met this amazing teacher. Her name is Carol Baker. Uh, I'll never forget her. She was the architecture teacher. At, at Cast Tech. And what made her special was uh, this was the first time I had a class in high school that lasted for two consecutive class periods. So even as a, a young person, uh, you know, our architecture classes were long. But she made that class, I mean, extremely exciting. Uh, the types of projects that we worked on, um, you know, encouraging us to think about our city. She also took me to uh, the University of Detroit. Like she took us to critiques and presentations. Wow. Um, and it was one that she took me to at the University of Detroit you know, that pretty much cemented the fact that I was going to go to UDM and, and study architecture. Yeah, it was there I met uh, Dan Patera, who's, a, who's now the dean of the School of Architecture at University of Detroit. Uh, yeah, I remember I was a 11th grader mm -hmm. and uh, we met Dan Patera at a critique. Uh, it was like a four hour critique. You know, we were dreading going there because <laughs> it not only was it four hours, but it also was after school. Oh, man. We're there. But Dan is this massive personality. Uh, he's a Loeb fellow. Uh, he was the director of the Detroit Collaborative Design Center at the time and, and had a very... Um, opening and welcoming personality. And, you know, after seeing us at the school, he told each one of us that, you know, we have a place in architecture. And, uh, you know, University of Detroit Mercy was there to help them carve or create their niche, you know, and, and own our place. And he was telling us that as 11th graders. Uh, but he said it with conviction and passion. Like, you believe in them. Like, yes, I believe you. 
I'm coming. Help me. Like, let's, let's do this together. And uh, yeah, so in 11th grade, I, I knew I was going to University of Detroit. That's a powerful story. I, I'm also curious about, so you had this really important teacher, Carol Baker, Dan Patera with his acceptance and big personality sort of also lended some enthusiasm and excitement and opened some pathways. But from a young age, it seems to me like you've been training your eye and your mind to look at the city for ways that it could be redesigned or or how it works and why it works that way. Because you've you've seen all of these you know, renovation projects through your church. Your dad's a roofer and an interior designer. Um, you're in the stairwell listening to hip hop. And you've been studying architecture since you were a young kid. So did you see the city in a really granular kind of, this is how it works, x-ray vision kind of way? I wouldn't say uh, I seen the city in the, like how it works. You know, growing up in, you know, going to school in, in Detroit and and going to school in Highland Park my younger years. When I got older and I looked back at, you know, the neighborhood I grew up in and, you know, the, the paths we took walking to school or catching a bus to school, you know, this desolation was kind of normalized. Like you didn't realize how desolate lack of investment that there was in your community. I, I didn't realize some of the the issues because, you know, the vacant lot was the lot where we played football. The park, it didn't matter that it wasn't a playscape. As long as the basketball room was up, you could play basketball. It was not apparent to me growing up. But one of the things that was very clear to me, and again, always expressed, was to to question information when it's given to you or presented to you. Like with music, um, we listen to not just hip hop music, but a lot of gospel and blues, jazz. I played the trumpet. Uh, My dad had a jazz band when I was growing up. Uh, I played the trumpet in the band. And, you know, we had to write our own music because we couldn't go out and buy, you know, sheet music. So oftentimes we listened to music in the dining room. My dad played the guitar. His brother played the bass. I played the trumpet. So did my friend across the street, who was a few years older and one of the leaders in our school band, but we literally like wrote our own music from listening to songs. So we would have these jam sessions where we would, you know, modify what it is that we listen to and what we've written. And that is you know, where I think the idea of analyzing what's around you really came from. It was less from drawing and, and architecture. It was really my, my background and music. The last thing about uh, that experience in music is that you always have to slow music down. You know, I would hear certain notes or certain phrases in a song till you know I didn't want to hear that song ever again in life because we were trying to find the exact note mm-hmm. that was happening. Right. So you got a tape player, you're going back and forth, back and forth. And you know, that is something that you know I've put forward today with, you know, you know, hip hop architecture, the hip hop architecture camp. It's a deep analysis and, and questioning of, of what it is that we're hearing and, and finding ways to analyze it now from an architectural perspective, not with the goal of you know regurgitating or just playing it back, but you know, really understanding what's there embedded within the music that most people don't have the ability to hear. That's fascinating. I, thank you for for breaking that down and painting that picture. So, and it makes sense. You know, from the research that I've done about you, that that analysis of music and its and its parts, and then a, a reinterpretation and a questioning of its its meaning and its poetry would be formative for you. So, you went to UDM, wrote a pretty important document. Your thesis was set the stage for the rest of your work. Why don't you tell me about your college years and what that was like for you? It, it was, you know, the best time of my life. You know, while at UDM, I did the study abroad. So I went to Warsaw for about six months. And then, you know, me and my best friend who also went to high school with me, he did that study abroad. So then him and I traveled around Europe for a month after that. Wow. And it was at that time that we realized how big hip hop is. 
So this is like a 2003 and we're traveling around Europe. We had this experience that we still talk about to this day. We're in Prague. We go to this nightclub and you know, a lot of places play hip hop music. You know, we always found a, like a lounge or a bar that we can go hang out with uh, after studying during the day. This club in, in Prague plays a 50 cent song. My friend and I were sitting there and some people come up to us and they're like almost trying to show us that they can rap this 50 cent song. <laughs> these are complete strangers. And we're like, yeah, OK, 50 cent. We rap it with them. And a song goes off when we start to talk and they did not speak English. Oh. That was mind blowing. They are rapping a 50 cent song word for word. They're here at the table, you know, all the hand gestures. We're like, okay, yes, we're excited. We're about to have a conversation about, you know, hip hop. And it was like maybe three or four young people. They were traveling from another country as well. And uh, yeah, they didn't speak English. The best way I can describe it is mind blown. And also just such a testament to how transcendent hip hop is. It transcended all the language barriers. Yeah. So now at this moment, uh, we, we come back, you know, a lot of, a lot of other things happen while we're traveling that, you know, uh, around hip hop too, letting us understand how global the culture really is. Break dancing is something that is you know, one of the elements of hip hop that is definitely different when you look at other countries, like they still practice some of the traditional parts of, of breaking. So, I mean, we're seeing people perform on the streets. It opened our eyes up to how global hip hop culture is. So now we're back. We're at UDM. It's our later years. We're my third and fourth year students. We start to incorporate music uh, into our architecture projects. Now, we've gone from you know, the shadow studies and the abstract architectural projects that you might explore in your earlier years. And now we're doing animations and walkthroughs of actual projects. And we would always slip a song or lyrics into our animations that spoke to architecture or design or whatever it was that we were working on at that moment. And for us, it was the biggest thing ever, like to find that perfect song. So we had massive amounts of CDs. My best friend is a DJ. He DJed his entire college career, DJed all the school parties. He DJed at nightclubs on Friday and Saturday nights. So he was you know, like the music savant. Whenever we work on a project, he would make suggestions. Hey, let's use this song where he said this or where she said that. I'm like, all right, and we'll clip it and we'll put it in our animation. And then we would invite our friends who are non-architectural students to come to our critiques. And I mean, we would all like smile and smirk, give a nod, give that wink when we heard that rap song that said, Whatever it was we were talking about, you know, and our friends were like, oh, that was so sweet. You know, how did you link the music with the architecture? And that was happening just as something we would do for fun. Sometimes it was curse, word, curse words in it. And right there, we're just throwing something over our professor's head because they just hear a beat. They don't really hear the words, mm-hmm. they know what's being said. So that was our, our fun times that we had with our design projects. Fast forward to our graduate school. So I went to UDM for graduate school as well. You know, the summer before grad school started, we started studying our thesis. So doing a number of investigations, writing our thesis statement. And I started off studying vertical cities. So looking at um, skyscrapers that are now becoming cities. And I got bored, to be honest, within a month of studying that during the summer. It's like, there's no way I'm going to spend an entire year studying this topic. But I pressed on because I had already written so much. My professor was loving it. Like the first week of school, this is where the hip hop uh, architecture thesis came in. So that same friend, his name is Eric Christian. Uh, he still works with me today for the hip hop architecture camp. Uh, I'm talking with him. We're about to give our presentations to all the undergrad graduate students about what our thesis is and invite them to come look around our studio throughout the year to see what we're doing. And our professors are there. And I stood up. Well, before I stood up, I'm, I'm talking to Eric like, yo, I don't want to do this. Like, this is my last moment. I want to do something more fun. He's like, hey, say it. it's going to be like mixing hip hop and architecture. Because <laughs> we've been doing this for the last two years in our studio. Yeah. I'm like, what? He's like, I dare you. <laughs> <laughs> so 
you know, you got to take the dare. Yeah. No, joking. <laughs> joking. It wasn't just taking the dare. But I'm like, you know what? That makes sense. So when I stood up, I was like, yeah, my thesis is going to be a cultural innovation. It's like hip hop inspired architecture and design. And you know, my professor looks like, what? <laughs> That's not what we've been discussing. Yeah, I said it. And, you know, UDM became a place that helped me explore this idea, even though it was something that no one uh, knew what the thesis would be, including myself. Right. But they were able to bring in other resources. Uh, Dr. Craig Wilkins is a professor uh, at the University of Michigan. So I was able to get introduced to some of his work. Him and Dan Patera were pretty close. So Dan was you know, adamant about me uh, connecting with Craig or at least seeing some of the work that Craig was doing that, that studied uh, music and architecture. And at the end of that graduate year, the thesis was an exploration of everything within hip hop culture, not just music, but looking at breakdancing, DJ, graffiti, and then even got down to the language, like the word creation and how the culture is disseminated around the world. I'm trying to see how architecture can can learn from hip hop. And this is that deep analysis that you've gotten so good at. Now, I'll say when the thesis was over, I still didn't know, you know what happens when you could buy hip hop and architecture. <laughs> uh-huh. I think the thesis and the you know, professors there at the University of Detroit were good at asking questions. Mm-hmm. And I think the thesis ended with, in my opinion, a, a series of questions more than an answer. But I've spent, you know, my career, you know, going back to that thesis and, and answering, you know, some of those questions. So uh, some of the things I explored as a student was, you know, how can you analyze music mathematically? How can you visualize music? How can you touch and feel music? Uh, so music already gives you a certain feeling, right? An emotional response provokes the, these emotions. How can you feel music? How can you touch music? And then what's the difference from holding a hip hop song versus a country song or a blues song? So these were things I was exploring and looking at different mediums to create that tactile experience. And eventually it became a curriculum for you know what I'm doing today with the hip hop architecture camp. Okay, so I can't wait to talk about Hip Hop Architecture Camp, but I need to know a little bit about between the thesis that you just explained and before you founded Hip Hop Architecture Camp. Like, how do you write a thesis like that and investigate all of these interesting and important questions and not have answers, but still have like a really strong foundation for investigation and question asking? And then how do you translate that into your professional self? After you graduate, it's time to go get a job. What do you do? One of the gyms in Detroit uh, is an architect named Rainey Hamilton, uh, African-American architect who has been in Detroit through thick and thin. He has been there and almost every black architect or designer who's grown up in the city has worked for or with Rainey somehow, some way. So when I was graduating from UDM, I met Rainy Hamilton, and you know, that was my, my first job at Hamilton Anderson Associates. While at Hamilton Anderson, you know, I got to work on a variety of projects. Two of the projects that were interesting as far as pairing Black music and architecture were Louis Armstrong Park in New Orleans. So after Hurricane Katrina, uh, Hamilton Anderson um, opened an office in New Orleans, and you know, Louis Armstrong Park was one of the projects that we worked on, which is restoring that park. But Louis Armstrong Park is dedicated to New Orleans natives and their contribution to jazz. Oh, this sounds perfect for you. <laughs> right? Yeah. So it's uh, uh, Louis Armstrong, Mahalia Jackson, and uh, a number of other folks from New Orleans. So it's this park that um, you know told their their history. So that was an exciting project. It was more of a landscape architecture project than it was uh, architecture. But you know, everyone knowing my interest in, in blending music and architecture, uh, it was a project that I you know, had some heavy involvement with uh, during the design phases. And then another project was the Motown Museum expansion. 
just now a project that everybody should definitely check out. You know, Hamilton Anderson and Perkins and Will are on that project in Detroit. But long before what it is today, uh, Hamilton Anderson did some studies for Barry Gordy and Motown about what an expansion of that museum can be. And this was a project that, you know, Rainey Hamilton was hands on with. And then myself and another architect in, in Detroit, Russell Baltimore. But it was the three of us working together. I'm probably sure there were some other people here and there. But those studies for Motown Museum's expansion uh, was definitely an exciting project for me. Because now I'm talking about jazz with Louis Armstrong Park. I'm looking at Motown. You know, my thesis is about hip hop. So now I'm just looking for a church project and I can like round out some of the black music experience. <laughs> and the Motown Museum project now is you know, it's back. And I wish I was still in Detroit working on this project now that it's uh, been funded and it's uh, it's a real project. Fast forward to today. I mean, I, I, well, I left Hamilton Anderson and I moved to Madison, Wisconsin. So Detroit had you know its economic challenges and being a young uh, designer in a city that's limited as far as the, the building has happened. I needed to get somewhere where I can continue to work on work on projects, sizable projects, and, and learn as much as I could. So I moved to Madison to work at a firm uh, called FLAD. The reason why I chose FLAD is the project types are completely different. It's mostly science and technology, higher ed, but they had a model that, that struck home. Their model is they only work on projects which improve the quality of life. Oh, that should be everybody's model. <laughs> And they stick to it. So coming to FLAD, you know, I worked on research facilities and, and really, uh, you know, had an opportunity to get an inside look at how various researchers, whether it was you know, in the medical fields, you know, worked on Wisconsin State Lab of Hygiene. I got to learn a lot about researchers and their detailed processes. That definitely was something I pulled into you know, my studies with hip hop architecture, like what are some deeper ways to uh, analyze the culture. While working at Hamilton Anderson and, and working at FLAT, I always worked as an educator as well. So I went back to my alma mater while at Hamilton Anderson and I taught design courses, taught 3D modeling courses at night. The same thing at FLAT, worked during the day, uh, but then taught at a local college, getting design courses and uh, technology courses there. So I always had this dual role as working within the profession, but then also creating the, the next generation of architects and designers. Yeah. So is that, I was going to ask you, is that your pull towards being an educator is influencing the next generation? Yeah, it's influencing the next generation. And more importantly, I want to reach back and provide avenues for them to bring their culture into the space and not check it at the door. Yeah, I see that. That's important. Very important. You know, that's that's the big thing with, with teaching and um, letting young people know that your culture, uh, specifically hip hop culture, uh, is something that everyone wants to copy and emulate while also telling you not to do it. You know, don't dress like that. Don't walk like that. Don't talk like that. But he said, you told me not to wear my baggy clothes, but Levi made a whole line of like loose fit and baggy jeans. So why shouldn't I wear my clothes like the fashion industry is is copying what we're doing and missing the creativity and what it is that we're doing. It's like, hey, I had these hand-me-downs from my big cousin or my big brother. And I'm going to make these hand-me-downs look so fly. You're not going to want to rock your new clothes. <laughs> You need to go find some big baggy shit just like I got on. <laughs> now, I don't feel out of place because I got my brother's clothes on. You feel out of place because you have those new jeans on. So it's like this creativity, this mindset that the culture has. And I want young know, people coming into architecture to have that same mindset and not check that at the door. You have something that they need or want, but it is how do you bring it into that space? That's you know, a lot of the conversations I had while while teaching and eventually while teaching here in Madison, I was working on a you know getting young people 
civically engaged. So the hip hop architecture camp and the way that it got started was uh, you know, I took some students to a city planning meeting and it was about the city's strategic plan. So looking 40 years into the future, the city of Madison, like what things should they focus on? over these next 40 years. And we had the the clickers in our hand. You can answer the multiple choice questions with these clickers. And it was some demographic questions. And it was like, after everybody clicked the answer, the average age in that room was like late 40s or early 50s. You know, it was mostly white males. Like you're seeing it, it's huge right there on the screen. It was two black people in the space, uh, myself and an alderman. Uh, again, that average age was pretty high. And if we're talking about what the city of Madison will be doing over the next 40 years, I posed a simple question to the planning department and the mayor's office. Why don't we get younger people involved in this process who will inherit these decisions when they are in their prime versus letting 50 year olds make these decisions who will be 90 when everything is implemented? We had multiple conversations. They were like, yes, we agree. We've been trying to do it. We invite everyone, but no one is coming. Like, what's your solution to get people to come up? I said, well, let's mix music with this planning process. I'm going to you know, make a, a hip hop architecture camp. At that Love point, it. they were like too far in to say no. Yeah. So it's like, all right, let's do it. Let's see what happens. That was the first hip hop architecture camp. It was a partnership with the city of Madison to get young people engaged with the the city's comprehensive plan. So can you describe what the hip hop architecture camp is and what the experience is like? What happens in the course of a camp? The hip hop architecture camp uses hip hop culture to critique, analyze and, and generate architecture. And the goal, ultimate goal of the, Hip hop architecture camp is to you know, increase diversity in design fields such as architecture and urban planning. How old are the kids? These are middle school and high school students. Okay. Traditionally, it's a, a week long program. You know, during a camp, we use lyrics as a way to explore the city that we're in. We deconstruct lyrics. So instead of listening to music, a lot of times, you know, we we print off lyrics or we have students print off some of their favorite lyrics. And then we identify the critiques that are embedded within that music. Can you share an example? I'll share one of the more storied examples. Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. It's a song called The Message, which is one of the most popular hip hop songs of all time. They are talking about all of the challenges in their neighborhood, you know, opening lyrics like broken glass everywhere, people pissing on the stairs, you know, they just don't care. Can't take the smell, can't take the noise, got no money to move out because I got no choice. So they're talking about the conditions of the physical space. They're talking about the psychological impact that the physical space have on the inhabitants. And then they're also talking about the structural systemic racism that is embedded within that architecture, which prevents people from moving out or moving into other areas. So that song is very complex and rich for the individuals who have the ability to break it down, to to hear what's being said. Most people want to dance to the music, but I encourage people, don't just dance, let's, let's respond to the music. So that's an example, but during the camp, we will break down lyrics you know, I've created a process that you know, allows young people to mathematically deconstruct the dexterity of like their favorite MC and then reconstruct it as architecture. So you can compare you know, for young kids, Cardi B and Nicki Minaj. They can compare who is the most complex as far as their lyricism by looking at the structures that result from their verses. And it's not a sonic experience, right? They can like literally see and hold uh, a verse from the two of them and you know, see who's the most complex in the scene. How are the kids responding to this? I'm sure it's like a whole new way for them to look at and experience the music. 
the, the kid's response is great. You know, it always starts off with, what are we doing? Yeah. You know, like, and you know, we show them the final results. Like, what? That's not a song by Two Chains. That's something you made up. That's some buildings. It's like, no, it's a Two Chain song. After they go through the process of, you know, breaking down and rebuilding a, a song. And then we have architects, urban planners, or engineers who come in and, you know, serve as volunteers during the camp. You know, and the volunteers are saying, well, look at the density in this area. And the kids are like, the density? No, that's just where he had a lot of rhymes right there. Because where the rhymes occur, you have these vertical structures starting to come out of this landscape. And it's interesting to see the language that's on display during the camp where uh, you know, architects and other design professionals can now start to talk about repetition, and scale, density, et cetera. But the kids are like, no, I, all that that you're saying, like this is just how complex the rhyme was. Lauren Hill packs this line with rhymes here. So it, it allows for this architectural language, you know, all of the, the jargon that we speak to be broken down and, and there's this interesting I transfer of, of, and share of knowledge from both sides. The last thing that we do is now that we've broken down music, we also have our young people create music at the end of the camp. So they've created a building or a city, but now they have to make a rap about it. So it's not your traditional architectural presentation at the end of our camps. Our camps end with a, a cipher. Kids spit a rhyme about whatever it is that they design. Oh, my God, this is amazing. And, then, and we invite you know, different celebrities, you know, hip hop artists, athletes, et cetera, to our camp. So we've had like Damian Lillard from the Portland Trailblazers. You know, he released a rap album in that same year. You know, he came to our hip hop architecture camp in Portland. You know, we've had like Lupe Fiasco, a number of artists and athletes that have come to our camps you know, tell young people or show young people how to write a verse, how to make that verse complex. So wordplay and not only wordplay, but looking at things like double entendres and how you can talk about architecture, but not talk about architecture. But it's very exciting and fun. But after that cypher, we pick like the best verses, take them to a studio, and we make a song. So kids go to a studio during the evening and they record the song uh, from the verses that they made earlier in the day. And then the last, the very last day of the camp, uh, we go around that city, you know, shooting our music video. The kids are excited, you know, throughout the camp. Uh, the program is 100% free because of our sponsors and our partners. So we don't use a fee, even if it's nominal. Like people say, well, we only charge $100 or $50. We charge absolutely nothing. And we depend on creating an engaging curriculum more than, you know, my mama gave you $100 and I got to come every day. <laughs> and when I say hundred dollars, that's being nice because I mean there are architecture camps that are you know, two thousand, three thousand dollars for young people to be involved in. Which is an accessibility issue. I mean, that's a problem that that expensive price tag on a youth program automatically eliminates some people from being able to access it. The free price tag on hip hop architecture camp is sounds like it's very important and aligned with your values. Yeah, so it's extremely important. If we want to you know, diversify the profession, we have to make it accessible. And then if we, you know, once we make it accessible, uh, you know, it's not just about diversity. For me, the hip hop architecture camp is, is providing an approach to architecture and a unique vernacular that will set these students apart from their peers when they are in high school and architecture schools, like this will be a unique approach. You know, sets them apart from their peers. Many people throughout history have used black culture to, you know, elevate their careers, whether it's been Picasso. And I talk about Kobu a lot who chased black music and wanted to implement it into his design. And uh, Elvis Presley, right? <laughs> like yeah. A lot of people have used black culture to elevate their careers. But you know, how can the originators use their own culture to propel themselves as opposed to having the culture vultures uh, be the only ones who you know, benefit financially from the innovation that is within our culture? 
Amen. I love hip hop architecture camp. I love the mission and your your ethos and the way that you're implementing it. And I also imagine it's incredibly rewarding for you. I, I hope you get some joy from the whole process because it just sounds like such a joyful experience. Yeah, it, it is. One more quick thing is that like the hip hop architecture camp, one of the things that is a, a misconception is that it's only for young people. You know, throughout the years, uh, this is our fifth year, still a young program, but we've evolved and you know, we've been a part of you know, various projects as a tool for community engagement, community involvement you know, with adults. We've also conducted design ciphers where we bring in you know, hip hop artists and, and architects and designers and technology or AI specialists and lock them in a room for three days and see what comes out. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we've partnered with Autodesk to you know, conduct these design ciphers. But then the other thing is we also do service projects. So my high school, Cass Tech, made a Mike Ford day, which is extremely shocking. Wow. Just knowing the history of who graduated from the school and who has special days at the school. That was a shocker. But, you know, we give um, you know, a scholarship to you know, a high school student that's graduating and wants to study uh, architecture or one of the other related design fields. And then I um, also team with uh, Lupe Fiasco on a project that we call you know, Hip Hop for Humanity, something that I'm doing annually now. Um, but we went to Kenya, which just outside of Nairobi, I should say, but a foundation called the Sambu Girls Foundation. We work with them the leader of the Sambu Girls Foundation. She grew up as a part of the Sambu tribe and rescues young girls from you know, some historical practices there of like female genital mutilation, early marriage, et cetera. Um, and she grew up in a tribe and said, hey, you know, this is wrong. Worked with people throughout the country to have it outlawed and made illegal. You know, it, it's hard to enforce in some of the places outside of you know, the city. So she started Assemble Girls Foundation and was gifted a ton of land, but not the financial resources to build out the space. She's built buildings here and there throughout the years, but none of them have plumbing. So it's like 400 girls on their campus, but no running water. So they go they make a a trip, which is a, a one hour round trip to get water. And they fetch water throughout the day, all day, every day. There's young girls taking that trip to get water. You know, we went there with the University of Wisconsin, some students from from here in Madison. Lupe Fiasco is on a board of a group called Zero Mass Water, one of their investors. But he connected the dots with all of us and we were able to uh, go to the Center of Growth Foundation and uh, give them water through a technology that Zero Mass Water created, like these water panels. You know, it extracts water vapor from the air, condenses it, and turns it into drinking water. We jokingly called it Vibranium. So this was like the same year that Black Panther came out. You know, there's this futuristic technology, and you know, uh, Rupi has a song that you know I used to define this project, which is you know, hip hop saved my life. You know, so that was a moment for me. Uh, my wife went with me as well, but it was an exciting moment and in full circle. Um, for the hip hop architecture camp, being able to you know, provide a resource, um, not just allow people to envision what makes their communities better or safer. It was actually you know, creating a vision and then solving that issue, which was access to water. So we beyond visualizing or conceptualizing and actually solving the issue. Um, and it was full circle because my wife grew up in Detroit in a house that did not have running water. Okay. You can just imagine what life was like with like eight brothers and sisters. So uh, look, being in the middle of a major city uh, without running water, it was definitely a difficult life as a young lady. So to go there and see all these smiling young girls now, knowing that they don't have to endure uh, you know, some of the things my wife went through. It was pretty dope. Yeah, that's amazing. And that's such a, a powerful story and, a, and an amazing impact. Now all of those girls who don't have to commit hours and hours of their day to the labor of of bringing water 
can commit those hours to their own education, their own empowerment, their own quality of life, so many things. Exactly. So there's a there's a project you're involved in now that I'd love to hear all about. It's called Conversations for Change. And, you know, I'll just sort of paraphrase it. You tell me if I get it right. But it it's a fundraising campaign you're doing with Herman Miller, wherein you remixed one of the iconic Eames lounge chairs. And that lounge chair is now traveling around the country. You are hosting conversations with people sitting in the lounge chair on Instagram Live around important topics, racial justice, things like that, um, as a sort of current commentary on the historic tagline of that chair, which is a special refuge for the strains of modern living. So, I mean, I wonder if you can tell me, first of all, describe the, the remixed lounge chair, tell me how this project came together and how it's going and, and what some of these conversations have been like in terms of just being able to discuss things that need to be talked about. I'm really curious about this endeavor. Yeah, so the Conversations for Change uh, started after you know, the death of George Floyd. Uh, I was commissioned by the city of Madison to make a mural on one of our major thoroughfares. Uh, the mural was on the Museum of Contemporary Art here in Madison. Um, just like every other city, you know, a lot of the businesses were boarding up during you know the uprisings and, and calls for justice. But then you also had COVID as well, right? So a lot of the businesses were closed. So it was the city's mission to allow a safe space and a highly visible space for Black artists to uh, express, you know, the tensions that are that are going on. I'm good friends with some folks here on the Arts Commission, and an artist. I was not showing up, so the director of the commission calls me like, hey, can you do a mural? Sure. How much time do I have? It's tonight. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so, yeah, so I make this mural, and what we did was we wanted to express time in a new dimension. So I wanted to look at the eight minutes and 46 seconds that Officer Shavin had his knee on George Floyd's neck. And I teamed with a friend of mine, Rafika Saad, who is also an architectural designer here in Madison. And what we did was we painted one tick mark for each second. So it ends up being um, a piece that we call 526 missed opportunities. And it's 526 missed opportunities for another officer to stop the unnecessary murder of George Floyd. We wanted people to see eight minutes and 46 seconds yeah. laid out. Um, so it's this time lapse video, it's more of a performance piece. Um, and it became, you know, a conversation piece of people were doing photo shoots, uh, like some, you know, local artists, hip hop artists or rappers. They uh, did music videos and incorporated the piece. Unfortunately, someone did not agree with the message, had an alternative message and went and put a strike through each one of the seconds. It was caught on video uh, by some teens. You know, they put it on Facebook. You know, starts to rack up all these views. Eventually, they find me and tag me in it. And the city tried to fix it. They did a good job. Uh, but then she came back and like destroyed it beyond repair. So I did a news interview, and that's where Herman Miller see me. I, I'm doing an interview about fixing the mural. Uh, Herman Miller reached out. Some of their uh, reps here in Madison said, hey, we learned about the hip-hop architecture camp. We love the mural and what it stood for and how you're restoring it. You know, how can we help? How can we be a part? You know, I knew about Charles and Ray Eames from um, architectural history and theory courses and knew about that piece, the Eames lounge chair, the ottoman. So I'm like, you know, let's do a mural on the Eames chair and let's get your customers. Let's get you know, Herman Miller faithfuls to you know, contribute to creating safe space for black and brown youth. Um, so brought up that quote uh, about the Eames Lounge Share and Ottoman being a, a refuge from the strains of modern day living. And what I did with the piece was I wrote the names of victims of you know, racial violence throughout uh, America's history, black victims, uh, and said that these were people who were not afforded 
that place of refuge. And we created a series of conversations around it. And I teamed with the Boys and Girls Club here uh, in Madison. It's called the Boys and Girls Club of, of Dane County. Team with them um, because of the work that they're doing in the community to create safe spaces for youth. So the chairs traveling around the country. We started off in Detroit, went to D.C., it's now in Atlanta. Uh, then we'll be going to L.A. and back here to Wisconsin. And we're talking with change makers, activists, artists, uh, designers about what their safe place is, but then also talking about you know, some of the challenges that they face in their careers when it comes to racism and also just what's happening in, in, in the world today. Uh, now that everybody is keen on observing what's happening. So it, it's some interesting discussions. You know, and discussions are really that you know, this has been happening for decades, but now people are finally taking notice and uh, we want to move beyond the conversations and have people take a stand. So it's interesting to use a chair as a way to inspire people to take a stand. So there's my wordplay right there. <laughs> but, but yeah, so people can, it's, it's only one chair. Um, you know, it's not a line of chairs by Herman Miller. Um, so it's one chair that you know, people can go to design by Mike Ford, to design X Mike Ford, and they can make a contribution to the Hip Hop Architecture Camp uh, in Boys and Girls Club. So go to the site, you see a donate um, option. And you know, there's different tiers of donating to support the campaign. But if you want an opportunity to own the chair, uh, we're encouraging people to make a donation of $1,000 and then also uh, state why it is important to take a stand. At the end of this month, you know, we'll be going through those statements for people that uh, donated that amount and someone will become the, the owner of this chair. I love this. And I just want to let the listeners know if they missed any of these conversations that you've already hosted, they can find them on IGTV on your Instagram channel, right? Which is The Hip Hop Architect. Yes. Yep. You can find the conversations there. Uh, Herman Miller also has them on their IGTV as well. Yeah. It's, it's been interesting conversations with a variety of people. Like our, our last one we just had was with Dr. Dre. Dr. Dre was on a show, Yo MTV Raps, that was like responsible for like broadcasting hip hop across the globe, you know, making it so it wasn't just this New York, LA thing, really bringing hip hop to, to everybody. We talked with one of the set designers for the Trap Museum in Atlanta. It's another interesting conversation, just talking about you know, what it means to tell the story of trap music and the history of Atlanta and their contribution to the culture. Uh, we also talked with, uh, back home in Detroit, uh, Tommy Walker. He created Detroit versus Everybody. Also has a movement called Everybody versus Injustice. And, and last, uh, one of the most interesting conversations, uh, and I say that because we had a similar experience uh, painting a mural for a city, but uh, an artist named Shifi McFly uh, this dude is amazing <laughs> in Detroit. Yeah, he got commissioned to paint a mural, or a number of murals for the city of Detroit. But while painting one of the murals, like one of the first ones, he was arrested by police. And it wasn't just one car. He said it was seven cars that showed up to arrest him for painting the mural. Totally disregarded the fact that you know, he had a permit in his book bag and he wanted to reach for it. You know, it was a scuffle. It's like, what are you going for? It's like, yo showing you my permit. It's like, we don't want to see that. Uh, but it, it became like national news. And, you know, luckily he survived the encounter. But, you know, his career blossomed after you know, that injustice. So having those conversations with creatives about the injustices that they face, even when they're in an assumed safe space. Yeah. So that's what this... Uh, these conversations for change are all about. And, you know, Herman Miller has you know, an entire rollout of diversity and inclusion initiatives. Um, and, and this is just one of the, the many things that they're doing in and around uh, the design professions to um, spark change. 
Well, I'm glad to hear it. And much change is needed. And attention to the injustice is one thing, but I but taking a stand is the next. I'm grateful that you're sharing this story with us and that we can participate and also contribute. So we'll share all of those links on the show notes for sure. And be- before I let you go, I know I've, I've kept you for a long time. I do want to learn about the Universal Hip Hop Museum in the Bronx, because that's a project that you're leading the design of that sounds pretty important and also right up your alley. So can you tell us about that? Yeah. So the, the Universal Hip Hop Museum is a project I've been working on for at least about six years. So I was brought on by uh, Curtis Blow and the executive director of the Universal Hip Hop Museum, uh, Rocky Bucano, um, when they heard of this guy calling himself the hip hop architect. Um, so one of the board members, it's like small world, one of the board members was here at the University of Wisconsin. You know, uh, at the time, he ran a hip hop program at, at UW. And he's in a meeting uh, right now. At that moment, they were simply trying to find a space, have been having a number of programmatic discussions. And now they're looking for you know, a space for the home for the museum. And I had no renders, no floor plan, like no collateral at all. And he's like, hey, I know this guy calls himself the hip hop architect. He's in Madison. Curtis, well, you should meet him. And, you know, the rest was history. We have a call. I meet, um, you know, the executive uh, leadership for the museum. And then at that time I was brought on and they're like, hey, can we get a rendering of what the museum could look like? We want to use it for our, our capital campaign. It's no way I'm going to make an image for the museum by myself. So I created these series of design ciphers and we brought rappers and uh, designers and architects to a session. And I was there in the Bronx. It was at the Bronx County Courthouse. It's been shuttered for a number of years, but we activated this abandoned building in the middle of the Bronx. And we stayed there for about three days, three or four days, and we had a charrette uh, about what the museum, uh, how it should look. Netflix came in um, at the end of that charrette, and they did a special screening of The Get Down, this docu-series that came out about the formation of, of hip-hop in the Bronx. So it was right up, you're right, it was right up my alley. I was excited to do it. I brought in, you know, Dr. Craig Wilkins to be a part of the discussions. And we were sitting there, you know, elbow to elbow with not just hip hop artists, but you know, people who were there at the beginning who are responsible for the creation of the culture. Um, so we had like the DJ who invented scratching, um, Curtis Blow, and a number of other pivotal people, Roxanne Chante, and you have these young designers and architects, you know, asking questions in the session. Uh, So that was my first involvement with them. And then from there, I teamed with the museum and Microsoft, and we did a national series of design ciphers. We went around to the different hubs of hip hop, went to LA, went to Atlanta, went to Detroit, and, and had a similar session with artists and residents there about what the museum should be. So fast forward to today, we've looked at multiple sites uh, around the Bronx. They were committed to being in the Bronx. They didn't want to have a similar story to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which ended up in Cleveland. Nothing against the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. They are advisors to the Hip Hop Museum, but the Hip Hop Museum was committed to being in a place that birthed the culture. So fast forward to today, multiple sites, multiple peaks and valleys along this story. Multiple artists have been involved. Um, the project landed as part of a mixed use development that is breaking ground. You know, the date has moved a number of times because of COVID-19, but the development is breaking ground. Um, it's mixed use development with low income housing, the universal hip Hip Hop Museum is the cultural anchor on the, the first two floors. Uh, there are other programmatic elements like uh, the Bronx Children's Museum and, again, a number of places or spaces within this mixed-use development. 
But yeah, it, it's an exciting project, and um, they are still, you know, in the fundraising phase of that project. It's tremendously helpful to be a part of this mixed use uh, development that you know construction can start as the museum continues to to raise funds to to build out their space. So exciting, and I'm really looking forward to when it becomes a reality that we can all go visit. But in the meantime, I'm glad you're spearheading this because it would be, seems like it would be a travesty for anybody else to be running this project. It's been an interesting journey. I've joined the museum, uh, you know, as the director of design uh, at the Universal Hip Hop Museum, something they wanted to cement and and make a even more direct, you know, tangible link between myself and the, the Universal Hip Hop Museum. So we've learned a lot about your career and your motivation and the deep analysis of hip hop and hip hop culture. But, you know, you do a lot of interviews and I sometimes wonder if there's something that not everybody asks or something that you feel like it's important to say. And I just want to open up this platform and give you that space to say anything that you want to say. Yeah. Thanks for asking that question. One of the most important things that uh, I would want people to understand and also use as a catalyst to, to take action is that the hip hop architecture camp, it always seems as if the, it's this heavily funded program. You know, we run a camp in over 30 cities. We've done these international programs. There's hip hop artists who are always showing up, or popping up at our events. And there's this misconception that, you know, we have this hefty budget, but that's not the case. Growing up, you know, in Highland Park and in Detroit, you know, I know how to make something out of nothing. I know how to stretch <laughs> some resources. <laughs> and I also, you know, you know, build friendships and, and connections with individuals, you know, who can come in and support their programming. You know, people have seen us like on the Oprah Winfrey Network or the Today Show, and like, oh, there's a Rolling Stone magazine. People will be shocked to learn, you know, how much funding we have uh, when we're putting on these events, which again are, are free. So a message that you know, I like to share is there have been and will continue to be a number of programs out there that, you know, introduce architecture, design uh, and or urban planning to youth. I encourage people to look at the programs that they have been funding for years. Look at those programs that have received, you know, the six and seven figures and, you know, question the impact. You know, we still have a very low number of, you know, diverse design professionals. What would happen if, you know, some of that money went to some of these grassroots organizations? I joke and say, you know, we can't mess up <laughs> any more than some of these uh, institutions and programs that, you know, have those six and seven figure uh, budgets. But it's time to you know, take an opportunity to, to fund organizations that are you know, bringing young people in and not having them check their culture at the door, but recognizing the creativity that has influenced the world. It's the most consumed culture in the world. How can we allow that culture to permeate architecture? Yeah, so I encourage people to you know, not just share videos or likes, which are all great, but you know, money matters. It's not just the hip hop architecture camp. There's programs like the you know, Loma's Project Pipeline. And there are other programs out there that you know, would benefit from you know, additional funding. And uh, the hip hop architecture camp is one. We just make stretching a dollar look very good. We're all about hip hop. Yes, you do. But to make a donation. Yeah, you can go to hiphoparchitecture.com. Uh, and there's a donate option there. Uh, it is 501c3. So the donations are uh, tax deductible uh, through our 501c3 partner. So hiphoparchitecture.com, click to donate and whatever you give you know, is beneficial to the program. Well, thank you for sharing that. And I truly hope that some of our listeners will consider making a donation because I really think what you're doing is incredibly valuable, not just to architecture and design communities, but to society. That's my endorsement. Now, I have one final question. 
I watched your TEDx talk, and I encourage all of our listeners to to go to YouTube and watch your TEDx talk as well. It's fascinating. And in that talk, you described hip hop as modernism's post occupancy report. You say that it defines the structures and planning that made the hood what it is. And you advocate, obviously, for constituents of hip hop culture to have voice, access, and agency in building the spaces and places that remedy the injustices faced by people of color at the hands of modernism. So Hip Hop Architecture Camp is creating and growing this army of designers. Fast forward several years to the next music movement incubated in the architecture created by this generation of hip hop architects. What do you think it sounds like? Good question. What does the architecture of the future that's designed by this army of hip hop architects, how does it look? How does the music sound? That, that's a good question. And for me, the way that it looks doesn't matter as much as the impact that it has on the people who inhabit the space. So I don't see hip hop architecture as this whimsical expression, although it could be, but it's not so much an aesthetic approach. It's an approach that you know brings justice to the people who, who use the spaces. The way that we achieve that aesthetic, you know, I think is, you know, derived from the ways that some of the elements were created and practiced. So looking at ways that, again, music or, or lyrics are structured, uh, the patterns within the music, or how does those structures and patterns now turn into architectural structures and patterns? Uh, but more specifically, the patterns that are talking about justice, that are talking about equality. Um, so lyrically, how does those structures and patterns turn into architectural structures and patterns that represent the same thing that the lyrics were talking about? Um, so those are you know, explorations that we are doing. Those are the projects that we are completing, such as the Sample Girls Foundation uh, project, uh, you know, annual scholarship giveaway. We're exploring those options and you know, trying to make that next era of Black architects and designers heavily equipped with the tools of their culture. Well, that is amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your your life story and all the work that you're doing. This has been a really incredible talk. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you for having me. Hey, thanks for listening. To see images and learn more from Michael, read the show notes. Click the link in the details of this episode on your podcast app or go to cleverpodcast.com where you can also sign up for our newsletter. Subscribe to Clever on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you want to rate and review, that would really help us out. We also love chatting with you on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can find us at Clever Podcast and you can find me at Amy Devers. Clever is produced by 2VDE Media with editing by Rich Straffolino, production assistance from Laura Jaramillo and Anushka Stepan, and music by L1011.